Right, okay. We should be we should be live on Raptor Aid's Facebook page. Um, Dr. Eugene Potapol, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I really appreciate this. You were you were one of my you were one of the ones I really wanted to get on. So I'm really I really appreciate you. Uh, yeah, you getting back to me and, and taking the time to uh, to chat to me. How are you? You okay? You all right? I'm very good. The yeah, pleasure is mine, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so what what like I, I described to you off screen, but the the running of these is normally pretty just relaxed because that's what I do, and and I'll try and ask you some. Pre well, no, they probably won't be that pressing questions, really. Um, but I always get people to start off the same way. Um, so you're you're based in you're based at the moment where you're sat is in in the states, and you're assistant professor at Bryn Athen College. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, uh, that is Pennsylvania. It's in the middle of riots now, a red zone in terms of COVID. Yeah. All over the place. Yes. <laughs> right, well, we won't go into the riots because that's all over the British news as well. So I'll leave that for a, 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 yeah another day. Um, but I want I always ask the same thing as I mentioned to you. Start at the beginning of your passion for birds and ra maybe raptors specific specifically. Where did it all Where did it all start for you? Um, your your love of birds, and then we'll go through and find out what you've done with your career. Well, uh, I, I know precisely the date, uh, uh, well, roughly, and the time, and, uh, and the place, and the place. And uh, the whole thing is actually uh, a small suburb of uh, St. Petersburg, Leningrad at the time. I was probably four or five years old, and uh, we were working in a, in a small place. Uh, um, actually, it was a uh, garden of this uh, suburb uh, called Komarova. It's kind of uh, nice place uh, which still exists on the maps. And uh, I looked on top and uh, probably at the time I saw uh, a uh, common buzzard. But uh, it was so impressive uh, and uh, it, the distance was so close and uh, I immediately shouted that uh, it was an eagle. And uh, my mom didn't disapprove because she wasn't sure and uh, 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 but she wasn't confident enough what it was. But uh, I remember that okay, you know that was uh, that was it. Uh, there were so so other things uh, in um, uh, in in the entire development of the career, uh, and that happened a few years um, later. It was actually I was probably six, and uh, um, so with this eagle in mind, uh, I knew there were some practical questions to solve in order to watch it more closely, and. Um, uh, that was uh, a, an outing uh, with my dad, with my sister, with my mom. So we went off uh, somewhere in the woods. Uh, and that was, uh, again, you know, the place was known. Um, that was uh, the Sister River. That was former border in between Finland and the uh, uh, Russian Empire. Uh, anyway, the um, uh, uh, wonderful thing was a tent, a rich tent, old-fashioned rich tent, which uh, my dad managed to put off and uh, and then there was a revolution in my mind you know the eagle was requiring to me be outside and here is a tent so you know these two things together the eagle and the tent uh, make it perfect solution so I immediately took up the resident the residence uh, in the tent and um, uh, I I was surprised because you know my dad had a cine camera and uh, he, he even uh, filmed this moment, although I realized what was going on much, much uh, uh, later. But uh, that was a moment when I saw all problems in the world were solved. Uh, the eagles were eagles, the buzzards were not, uh, not far away. Uh, I, by that time, I knew there were more, more other stuff like uh, sparrow hawks and ghost hawks and uh, kestrels around. Uh, and uh, a lot of other birds, which uh, um, uh, some of them were easy to identify, some not. But anyway, uh, the idea was, you know, to get out to the birds, and the tent was the solution. And then the dad said, okay, we have to go home. And I remember this incredible sense of betrayal, you know. 
here is a solution. You know, why do we need to come back? You know, yeah. we can stay here for, you know, as far as I understand forever. And uh, then we had to collapse the tent and bring back. So anyway, that was uh, the, the historic moment when uh, I reconcile uh, the necessity to be out in the, uh, in the wild uh, with uh, some simple tools where not, you only you just not just feel comfortable, but you feel at home and uh, the birds are out there. So, you know, everything else was uh, secondary. So ever since uh, two things, so wilderness, uh, tent, uh, there were a few other things like, you know, uh, technicalities, you know, binoculars, tripods and uh, uh, boats were added later on, but uh, that was a minor thing compared to this revolution, a simple tent. It's quite interesting that you should mention a tent and wilderness because when I when I shared this on, on our Facebook page, I mentioned that you've been to some of the remotest part and you 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 could almost say specialize or you, some of the remotest parts of the world is where you carry out your your research. It, That'd be right. Than that, I think I feel comfortable uh, when I don't see people probably 300 miles away. So, uh, and uh, that, that is my thing, you know. I, I'm not probably sort of uh, uh, not the best person to maintain uh, order in sort of well functioning lab system, you know, but I'm a trailblazer. I'm, I'm first to go. I know where the stuff is in the places where you wouldn't imagine. Yeah. And uh, uh, not only just uh, get there, but also how to feel comfortable there and how to uh, uh, to harmonize yourself with the nature there and most importantly with people up there. A lot of nomadic people, you know, they, they talk to me immediately, they, they see something, uh, they separate me. Um, Mongolian tribes, uh, Chukchi nomadic people, the reindeer people, the same thing. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing how we can find uh, common grounds. Even in New Zealand, you know, as I talked to a, a person once on the beach, uh, uh, this big lady was uh, trying to get eel by night following the regulations. We immediately figure out how to do it without, uh, uh, um, uh, without crossing uh, any bad legislation. So it was kind of amazing to see this thing. So Maori. Hmm. I don't dance haka, but we know how to find eel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, it, I followed your work and read read the odd thing about you. So, yeah, coming coming back then, um, before we go into your research, we've got to touch on you visiting the UK. Then, or well, I say visiting the UK, your your PhD that was that was at Oxford University. Am I right? In, that is true, Jimmy, but you know, it's a, it's a long, long story, you know, it's a, uh, the story goes, uh, uh, okay, some uh, prerequisite knowledge. I was uh, uh, sort of studying birds of prey uh, in, uh, in the tundra, in the Arctic tundra, mm -hmm. and uh, at, uh, initially I went there when I was doing my master's at the Leningrad uh, University or St. Petersburg University now. And uh, in order to get there, you have to be there in May. That means you have to get all the exams uh, uh, a month ahead. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that for almost three years in the university. So I have to convince uh, the dean, the, uh, all the professors, uh, you have to, to be excused. Uh, you have to go there because the only way to get to this place is to get on ice, on snow. And if you are there after m m 9th of May, your season is done, you, you cannot get there. So you have to be there a month ahead of all this uh, final exams at the university. So you have to convince people, so you go there uh, and you, the university even scrambled some sort of uh, ticket funds to go there. So you go there and my supervisor was very famous uh, ornithologist, he still is, uh, um, somebody called Andreev, he's specialist on grouse and geese. And uh, he was uh, keeping the uh, campsite in, in the Siberian tundra in Northeast Yakutia. That's the place where I still go. And um, uh, he would uh, sort of wait for me at the airport, put me in the Caterpillar tracked vehicle and we disappear in the wilderness. Then the snow melts and then the ice breaks and we're in isolation for two months or something. And uh, then he would leave me and then I have to come back uh, on my own uh, in, in the end of August somehow. Um,
anyhow, uh, that was uh, the setup. But then uh, there was uh, famous uh, Michael Gorbachev, uh, the guy who, um, uh, who was probably concentrating more power than even Stalin had. Uh, he was both the president and uh, the secretary of the Communist Party. He was uh, really amazing. And uh, yet he had to face a lot of opposition within the Politburo, so he has to be popular. So he opened up the Perestroika, opened this sort of uh, interesting uh, uh, reform box, and he let somebody else into the country. And the somebody else was uh, uh, George Soros with his fund. And he published a newspaper article saying, okay, if you are enrolled in... Um, postgraduate education, and uh, you can probably join me on the ticket of uh, uh, visiting scholarship at Oxford, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, that was interesting uh, article. Uh, that was year 1989, as far as I remember, 88. Um, and uh, I remember I was sitting in, uh, in my flat in Magadan. I was watching uh, the sunset uh, at the Nagaiba Bay. It was sort of ice floating, you know, very nice, uh, uh, really cold weather. The, there was first snowfall and I saw my car completely buried with snow. I thought, you know, okay, shall I dig it now? Shall I do it in the morning? And then I had my friend coming. He, he, he lived next door and uh, he brought a fish. Big uh, salmon, uh, uh, to be precise, it was king salmon, well sort of smoked. Uh, and we started to drink tea and uh, I was cutting this fish and the fish was wrapped in the newspaper. And uh, uh, this guy was uh, uh, looking at this newspaper wrapping and said, you know, okay, you know, here is an advert for, for you. Uh, he ripped it off and uh, you'll go to Oxford, he said. I said, wonderful, yes, Oxford, where is Oxford? It should be in Britain, wonderful. So I put it in the shirt like that, and we continued eating this fish, discussing a lot of uh, things which uh, uh, would mean that, you know, how we can get potatoes, unfrozen potatoes, you know, because if a ship goes to the harbor too, uh, too late in the season, the potato in the hull get frozen, so you cannot keep it. So that is kind of survival thing, but too much fish, less potatoes. But anyway, uh, so a few weeks later, I decided to wash my clothes and uh, was sort of getting all these uh, things, uh, getting this advert. I read it and it says, you know, okay, you know, there's uh, a fund in Moscow which uh, uh, opens around the block. Give us a call and we'll send you documents if you want to go in Oxford. Preconditions was you have to be enrolled as uh, uh, in postgraduate program, yep. which I was. Uh, anyhow, I uh, uh, decided that, okay, wonderful. Uh, so the major problem was to make a trunk call. You know, at that time, there were no fax machines, uh, no emails, no internet, no Facebook. For, come on, you know. So, so uh, I uh, looked uh, um, at the phone number to Moscow. I calculated the time, but you know it was doesn't doesn't matter because I have 24 hours, which is very unusual at the time. So I went to our institute. It was uh, called still is Institute of Biological Problems of the North, and said, you know, can I get a phone call? It was really major expense. You know, it's sort of five minutes of call to Moscow. That was pretty big deal at the time. So uh, anyway, they let me do it. So I had to go to the um, a director secretary, which has uh, the privilege to have this phone working with uh, uh, trunk calls. So I dialed this number, which was in this sort of uh, uh, um, uh, newspaper cutting. Uh, the lady on the other side uh, end was uh, really sort of a surprise, you know, okay, you're from Magadan, do you really want to go to Oxford? I said, of course yeah, I will, you know, who would say no to me? You know? so, so anyway, uh, they uh, sent me application forms uh, and uh, that was it. So uh, a month later, I was sitting in Magadan. I get this uh, package from Moscow saying, you know, here is application forms. I opened it up and they were in English. Okay, what shall I do? So uh, Oxford University, they say, you know, so what was known for Oxford University? Uh, I went to the Soviet encyclopedia, opened up the section of Oxford University, which uh, said that, you know, that is uh, a uh, unique uh, and uh, very aristocratic university, which is uh, run specifically for royals, but mostly for rich bourgeois. Yeah. Consists of colleges. Yeah. That was it. 
So uh, I was thinking, you know, what shall I do? I opened the application forms. It basically has this uh, two sets of application forms and one set the colleges. Okay, what would you do? No internet. The only library you have has a uh, Soviet encyclopedia. Magadan is kind of strange place and cultural thing. So what I did was uh, I thought that I need to uh, decipher how the system works. So I sat uh, uh, in our anthology lab and at that time, we had uh, uh, this uh, uh, system of uh, getting the reference uh, from all over the world. Either you sort of send a, a postcard, you know, please send the reference, or there was uh, um, abstracting services run by some Moscow universe institution, which has abstracting books. And you can uh, cut the abstract and you can order the reprint uh, from, from this Moscow, because at that time, even Xerox machine was unavailable. Yeah. So uh, as a result, uh, those people who lead rich literature, they sometimes get this uh, uh, foreign, in English, uh, papers, paper cuttings. And I sort of uh, started to go through and make uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, selection of those which have uh, Oxford address. So I get quite a big pile. Uh, and uh, then I started to make a table. I was reading uh, the most important uh, part of, uh, of this paper it's called Acknowledgements. So I made a list of people who were mentioned most. And then I realized, you know, there are dual system. There is university and there is set of colleges. So I list the colleges. I list people who worked for the colleges. I list the people who worked for, for the science, for the department. And uh, uh, then I just uh, sort of uh, narrow down this list to people who are close to my speciality. At that time, it was uh, uh, lemmings and uh, rodent eating um, birds of prey. Mm -hmm. And uh, two names popped up uh, on one hand. That was David Lack and Chris Perrins. Uh, David Lack was a pretty big name. Uh, uh, some of his books were translated in Russian and they were really sort of in the uh, main uh, bookshelf uh, in, in my lab. And I, I was in possession of uh, uh, the natural regulation of animal numbers, but David Lack was sacred. Uh, on the other hand, there was uh, uh, Charles Elton name listed and uh, uh, somebody uh, called John Clark as a lemming specialist. He was working with Dennis Chetty and something like that. And uh, he was mentioned in, in a college name. And uh, then I realized, okay, you know, I have to make an application to the college and I have to make an application to the uh, university, to the department of zoology. And I have to choose a person who would read my project. If it goes to the wrong person, I shouldn't do the whole thing. So I listed uh, uh, two names, David Lack and Chris Perrins, and uh, I sort of uh, stated uh, as... Uh, uh, John Clark as a potential supervisor who would see my and evaluate my project. And uh, then I started to write what I was doing in, uh, in, in Russia. Basically, it was my project, birds of prey, tundra, wonderful, Arctic, beautiful. However, major problem was you have to type English letters how you can get an English typewriter. So anyhow, I managed to find one and that was uh, in possession of the friend who originally brought this newspaper article to me. Uh, and uh, he was in possession of this um, uh, English typewriter because uh, uh, he had to type the Latin names of insects. He's very top, uh, well-known uh, arachnologist, really top of the world. Anyway, uh, I borrowed this typewriter. I managed to type my project, I put it in the envelope, and then I had to mail it to Moscow. And then there was a problem. Uh, at the end of this uh, uh, application form, which would go to Oxford, the bourgeois university run for royals, um, according to the uh, Soviet encyclopedia, yeah. uh, there was another uh, clause that I have to go to an interview in Moscow in the middle of the summer. And that was a major catch. So I thought, okay, you know, what if uh, I go to my uh, uh, site in Siberia, in the middle of nowhere, what would uh, a person uh, do if I need to come for an interview? 
So I supplied two addresses instead of one. And that was a key thing because what I knew and still, you know, the whole rule is that the KGB is watching our back. Like, yeah. So they want to control everything, including all papers we read, you know, great tits in the wide woods, you know, that is top secret information. You, know, you should be sort of cleared for this top classified information. You know, what if the states have freedom or freedom of clutch size. So that was something which uns was unspeakable. So anyway, I supplied another address. And I said, you know, I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere, but if you send a cable to this person who is in the, uh, a radio operator for another parallel expedition who was mapping the tundra, he would read me on the radio that I need to go to Moscow, if selected, of yeah. course. So anyhow, um, that was interesting because uh, uh, the uh, um, KGB is highly Soviet uh, enterprise. It works territorially. So if uh, a person monitors me in Magadan, he or she doesn't have anything to do for, with me in Yakutia. And Yakutian people think, okay, these guys are from Magadan, they'll be watched. Wonderful, that's what I needed. So anyhow, uh, I sent the application forms. It was uh, February or something like that. It was still winter and forget about that. I sort of, uh, uh, spring comes uh, uh, in, uh, in May, I am in the middle of the tundra in Yakutia with my birds. I was in charge with some five people at the time. So we came on helicopter then uh, uh, it was June, the uh, ice just went through. And I received uh, uh, the uh, radio cable from this uh, town in the middle of nowhere saying, you know, okay, somebody calls me in Moscow. Another uh, letter to summon me for this interview was sent to my institute in Magadan. And only when I graduated from Magadan, this letter was given to me. I tricked this KGB at that time. Anyhow, so you are sitting in the middle of nowhere, 300 kilometers away from you, there is a, uh, an airport and you have to be there tomorrow to catch a plane to Moscow. What yeah. would you do? So uh, what I did was uh, I uh, said, okay, guys, uh, if I go to Moscow, I'll be back in a week. If I cannot come to this uh, uh, settlement with airport, I'll be back in two days. I load my boat with fuel, nothing else, uh, and uh, off I go along the rivers, along the channel, you have to pass through seven lakes. One of them is really large lake uh, next to Lake Baikal, 100 okay. kilometers wide. Wow. Um, and uh, f uh, sort of uh, the uh, rivers were flooded and managed to get well uh, nonstop. Uh, uh, eight hours later, uh, I crossed two lakes. One was uh, with the uh, uh, ice which fall into needles, so you get, go through. Other one, I just uh, pull my boat across like Freaky of Nansen. Yeah. Uh, and then this uh, largest lake, uh, it's kind of 120 kilometers long. And uh, the channel goes on another side and uh, I just bumped into the ice. And I thought, okay, I'll wait for a couple of days uh, before the ice back will sort of, uh, will disappear and they'll come back. And I decided to have a tea. So I put my boat next to this ice sheet, which was 100 kilometers long, um, and uh, uh, get my primo stove, put the kettle on, it was uh, uh, sort of 20 hours of nonstop uh, pulling and uh, crossing. And uh, I was uh, sort of uh, watching, it, it's kind of really amazing time because it was uh, uh, kind of, uh, there's still picture in my, in my head. If just picture that, you know, you have a, a blue uh, stripe of water where I'm sitting on, uh, complete white ice, as far as you can see, uh, greenery on the tundra, uh, sandhill cranes dancing, uh, glaucous gulls buzzing ahead, trying to steal whatever you have. And then I have a flock, probably 40 plus uh, Ross's gulls just landing in front of me. I say, <gasps> Wonderful. They're kind of late in the season. They should be breeding, but uh, something uh, was going on. So this Ross's girls were sitting on this ice, this pink color on this white, uh, contrasting with the blue water. Wonderful. And then there was southerly wind. Southerly winds in the tundra, they are vicious. They are coming without warning. It's like, you know, 90 miles per hour from two seconds. It was just woof. 
big southerly wind blew off my kettle. It was rolling with this uh, 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 boiling water, sp spitting it all over the place. And I see in sort of this uh, Ross's gull flock just lifted off because, you know, it doesn't like to be on the ice when uh, uh, we have gale force winds. And I see the channel in front of me, just, you know, the southerly wind pushing the ice away. And I have probably 10 meters of channel. I immediately grab my uh, fire stove. Uh, I remember I was worrying because, you know, it was uh, still steaming hot, uh, um, a primo stove, and you put it on the cans uh, full of uh, uh, petrol. Sure, Not yeah. nice. It was fumes all over the place. But I thought, you know, okay, I'll, I'll get some jet acceleration. So I start my outboard, and off I go nonstop along this channel. Uh, so uh, we have uh, sort of uh, probably half a foot on one side, probably two meters on the other side. You have to maneuver. There is some vegetation there. But uh, the ice was pushed. So I was nonstop going along this channel for this 100 kilometers thing. And uh, then go to the side channel, another three or four lakes uh, across. Uh, uh, and, you know, in 12 hours, I'm coming to the settlement with the airport. And, of course, I see the plane to Moscow land sort of uh, taking off. I am six hours late for it. Uh. Um, Never mind, I thought, you know, come on, you know, uh, the Arctic North uh, was and still is run on favors. So I sort of came to, uh, to the uh, uh, friends whom, uh, these are the topographers which were working in the area and I kept my boat there. Uh, I came to these guys and say, you know, okay, look, you know, uh, it's midnight, I know, but let's pull some strings, I need to go to Moscow, you know, the cable. And I started to send telegrams to Moscow, you know. Ice conditions bad, but I'm making my head through, you know, missed my plane to Moscow because of ice conditions, you know, but I'm going to be on the next plane, this type of thing. So I keep them interested. Yeah. And uh, I thought, you know, I'll never give up. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine who, who was and still is uh, the pilot who monitors ice in the Arctic Ocean. And he said, wait, you know, uh, he called some uh, somebody on the tower and he says, you know, okay, there is a cargo plane in two hours, uh, ton, uh, 10 tons of fish or something like that. You'll sit and smell a thing, but don't, don't, don't worry, you know. So I came to this plane and they say, you know, okay, fine, you know, uh, it's going to be chilly, but never mind, you know, here is a stove, here is cattle. And I was in still my chest waders. Um, never mind. <laughs> so off we go to the place of Yakutsk. Uh, six hours journey uh, on, on 10 tons of fish, very nice white broad, broad white fish frozen from the um, uh, underground, uh, uh, underground uh, permafrost uh, freezers. And uh, six hours later, we'll, I land in Yakutsk, um, and that is uh, um, end of June, well, mid of June. And uh, I realize that there are no tickets to Moscow. All people booked in advance, and uh, what shall I do? So I remember in frustration, I came out from the Sikutsk airport, uh, and uh, I saw a bunch of people coming out from the car, and uh, the first people I saw was my supervisor, Andreev. That wasn't planned. No, I, uh, he, 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 he didn't see with surprise because that wasn't planned. You know, I have people in the tundra, what the heck, you know. It's, Remember, yeah. there were no satellite phones at the time. So uh, all, uh, you know, uh, to cut this palaver, I said, you know, okay, well, what on earth you are doing here? Uh, we exchanged the information, you know, and this guy was uh, bringing uh, an interesting visitor, a person who was uh, on, uh, in, in charge of biosis, biological abstracts or something, big tycoon. So he was uh, uh, prescribed by Moscow guys to, to bring his... Uh, uh, his Excellency uh, Millionaire to, to the Tundra to show the Ross's Gull, little wonder. Uh, and uh, he was taking this journey via Yakutsk because uh, Magadan was uh, uh, having only one plane per week. Anyhow, he was accompanied by another guy uh, who is a very famous uh, Yakutian ornithologist. Uh, and uh, his uh, son-in-law was working in the tower in the airport. He said, you know, wait a minute. We can sort you out. He sort of uh, knocked at the door, went to the tower. Two minutes later, he is with his uh, son-in-law saying, you know, okay, buy a ticket for any date. We can send you and set you in the cabin of pilots. You'll go to Moscow with this plane. But I said, you know, the plane is going to take off. Wait a minute. 
He went uh, to the tower. The plane was coming back. Pick me up. A stack of food was brought to me, and I uh, I was put in the um, in the pilot cabin as uh, Tupolev uh, 154 uh, jet, and I was flying to Moscow. The whole thing took 40 minutes. Wow. Okay, I land in Moscow, 3 a.m. in chest waders. <laughs> Smelling the fish. Well, imagine, well, that is perestroika time, you know, you cannot get shoes in Moscow airport uh, at 3 a.m. So in this outfit with this fish, smoked fish I had under my arm, <laughs> I arrived to this uh, uh, Soros Foundation in Moscow. That was uh, half past five uh, on a taxi. A taxi was looking at me with some kind of look number four. Uh, anyway. I knocked at the door, a lady opened up and said, you know, who are you? And they said, you know, I'm going to Oxford, you know. Are you sure? She said. Uh, okay, I said, okay, you know, so she looked through the papers uh, and thanks to my telegrams, which I was sending all over the place about this ice conditions and my progress, and I sent one from Yakutsk too. Uh, she said, oh, look, you know, this Oxford professors, they were waiting for you last night, but you didn't appear. Okay, she said, you know, they are just about to take plane to Heathrow, but if you go to their hotel, you can actually uh, have a lunch, you sort of have a breakfast with them. Yeah. Okay, breakfast, that's what I need. So I went to their hotel, Hotel Ukraine, still there, um, came up to this uh, guys, uh, they were starting to appear with their luggage. Uh, to have a breakfast. So, so, oh, okay, let's have a breakfast. We had very nice chat with this uh, Oxford Dons. I described what I did. I showed, I had this bag full of uh, secret maps that were all classified. Showing, you know, here is this lake, you know, here is this Ross's Gulf Lock, you know, Sand Hill Cranes here, you know, sort of this shallow, this is this nice ice, this is bad ice, this is solid ice. Um, and uh, they picked up the documents and said, okay, we'll see you later. Okay, off they go to the airport. I was looking around, nobody's in the hotel Ukraine. I get a cab to uh, to this uh, Soros Foundation again, knocked at the door and say, no, what shall I do? You know, you promised to pay me for the ticket, you know. Uh, and you should have seen the look of this lady. All of a sudden, she didn't look at me as this sort of savage from the Siberian and chest waiters. Now she said, Please, you know, let's have some tea. I said, why? Because, she said, they took your documents. That means they are processing my documents as an applicant. Okay. That means the possible people who would look at my project will be Chris Perrins and John Clark. And if I was correct, and I was indeed, you know, for, I, I, didn't, knew, I didn't know that um, uh, David Lack passed away at that time. If I mentioned him, nobody would uh, would uh, apply. Sort of, nobody would process my application. So, any then, anyhow, uh, at that stage, the Oxford application started. Only after all this ideal way how to navigate Arctic waters in good time and good matter with the Ross's Gulf. So, uh, anyhow, the. Um, uh, the, these guys they brought the uh, forums to Oxford, uh, and uh, at the autumn, I, uh, the uh, Soros Foundation processed the exit passport with exit visa for me. It was the USSR days. So in uh, in September, I was uh, on plane to Heathrow, all right. and all the rest was just technicalities because in Oxford there are a number of scholarships you can apply, and you know I look at the uh, uh, at this uh, Oxford handbook, which has all the rules and regulations with all the structure. It was you know, my guess initially. So then I improved my sort of uh, scholarship from visiting scholarship with no um, degrees, no certificates to something which leads to the uh, sort of uh, to defeal. And uh, I was successful in writing in uh, foreign language, uh, all this my interesting stuff uh, with this uh, Siberian um, uh, peregrines and uh, uh, and uh, falcons and, uh, and stuff. So that's the story. So it's a long way. Brilliant. I mean, it's a great, it's a fantastic insight, Eugene, into, you know, what it's like to work in 
in the the areas that you work in the, the research so what was your, your 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 phd was what was it what was it what was the title of your phd just out of interest for me i'm interested well uh, the title you know i i thought that it was uh, arctic birds of prey and uh, i had uh, listed all birds of prey i had observation with and i brought it uh, to chris parents uh, and um, he started alphabetically buzzards uh, ralph like buzzards he said you know it's too much he said uh for, forget about peregrines forget about um the uh, uh the owls uh let's do the ralph like buzzard because it uh it, it, it it's more or less uh, uh easy with the material you have uh, at hand okay. so i postponed everything else uh, and uh, i was still going for field seasons in siberia and uh, the topic was uh, converged to the uh, ecology and energetics of rough leg buzzard in the Siberian tundras. So that was probably one tenth what I had uh, at hand at the time. Still, you know, this material going on with these unbelievable changes in uh, in the Arctic, unbelievable. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, the. Um, uh, buzzard so work. Were, um, you, you were studying, obviously. You were work, studying in. Oxford, uh, or carrying out your, you, you know, writing up your research, and then every how how many years was that for? Every year that was uh, about four, 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 four more seasons. I was doing in the in the Arctic Siberia. Brilliant, that's that's fantastic. I just it's just nice to give people an insight into into the yeah what what can what goes into this this sort of work. So where does um, obviously, you've just you've just pointed out you've got a picture of a, a peregrine there, a Siberian peregrine. What's what's the one? What's behind your head? I'm not going to guess the falcon in case. That is not. a saker falcon. That is a saker falcon, and uh, the one up there uh, is uh, the uh, let me, uh, the stellar sea eagle. Right. Well, we'll come on to stellars in in a in a minute. Let's talk about. Where did the book? Obviously, you mentioned peregrines. You mentioned sakers and. and um, where does the where does the Jeer Falcon book the monograph? Because I imagine that's where a lot of people might know you know your name in in the birding world in the UK. Is is I've got a copy of it. Um, a lot of people like to ca collect the the mono the poison monographs that are especially first editions are very collectible. Where did where did that come? Come, how did that come about? Well, that was, uh, again, you know, uh, Jeer Falcon was listed among the uh, birds I was thinking to include into the um, doctoral thesis, but uh, it was too much, as uh, Chris Perrins said. Uh, but at the time when you submit uh, the uh, uh, thesis, you basically have to wait. And uh, I thought that uh, I would do something like that and i suggested it to, to a person who was uh, running poison monograph uh, and at that time it was purchased by the academic press uh, and this uh, a person said you know okay you know you you should write this thing and uh, uh, at that time i teamed up with uh, richard sale amazing writer with a lot of arctic experience and he said you know he will translate into my sort of russian english into english english uh, because you know, sort of Siberian accent doesn't really roll on well in the, in poison monographs. So we teamed up and uh, we uh, sort of approached the academic press formally, and they were excited to offer us a contract. Uh, then there were a sort of a uh, um, chain of um, uh, sales uh, because at that time internet was coming in and uh, all the publishers were panicking, and yet. Uh, uh, they were carrying the uh, um, uh, title, uh, regardless uh, to the ownership of the publishers. Uh, and uh, finally, when they settled up, they saying, okay, where is the text? We were able to roll the text. So it was my sort of pre-graduation project. That um, that's some project. Exactly. So I was uh, basically I submitted my thesis and uh, had, uh, well, there were some years before because of this uh, um, uh, kind of, chain of succession of publishers. Uh, it wasn't really not, uh, our fault, but uh, the initial suggestion was, and uh, the initial contract, and they even sent us 100 pounds each uh, as a sort of their interest. So it, I, I was really proud of it, you know, so wow. Um, so, um, so that was uh, the kind of uh, project, which was uh, uh, kind of not really included in the doctorate, but uh, it was originally meant to, 
Uh, and uh, I was carrying on more research. I was uh, sort of, uh, uh, Tom Cade was having similar projects uh, and uh, he approached the same publisher. Uh, and uh, I was surprised because this publisher decided that our project was uh, better than uh, Tom Cade's. Wow. I felt uh, it's kind of really strange, you know, it's, uh, for, for me, Tom Cade is kind of uh, really... <gasps> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we sort of uh, uh, chatted, and uh, when I was in the Astrays, he even sort of sponsored my um, trip to Copenhagen to to see every single Jure Falcon skin up there. Uh, so, sort of, uh, I, I felt kind of uh, strange because, on the one hand, uh, his project didn't materialize, um, and he offered me sort of uh, the. Uh, um, uh, co-authorship uh, at least initially i saw that you know 400 no it wasn't it was 2000 pages i i see the problem for uh, for the academic press at the time yeah uh, anyhow uh, uh that was kind of a title which went you know with no uh resistance whatsoever i was really impressed uh, bad thing is that there were a couple of chapters which uh, were written for the, for the book but didn't appear there. That was about falconry and uh, the practical uh, and ancient uh, history of uh, of uh, deer falcon usage in falconry. It was truncated somehow, but um, uh, unfortunately that wasn't uh, materialized. But anyhow, the, yeah, that was uh, the book, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was very basically uh, a formal systematic act nobody follows. It's Falca Gir Falca. Yeah. It's not Rusticolus, if you read it. But, you know, the world doesn't really uh, get convinced. So okay. you cannot be a Russian author in order to convince um, uh, the world. <laughs> well, it's... I mean that's 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 one hell of a thing to do in between waiting for your uh, for yeah, your thesis to uh, to get passed through. What um, you obviously mentioned about owls and studying mm -hmm. owls, covering owls, and that being left out of your thesis. Um, so obviously, I'm going to roll on into your other one of your other books, um, and which is more recent, which only mm -hmm. came out. I think it only came out was it two or three years ago? The snowy owl. Almost five. Oh, is it? Almost, right. okay. almost five. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm behind. Um, so how did, how, was, was that, that was going to happen anyway? Or was it a passion you thought, I've got to, I want to publish a book on the snow hill? Or did the, did obviously did Poyser or whoever come, the publishers come to you and say, we want a book on snowy owl? It's uh no, no, no. It was a, it was our suggestion. So, you know, uh, that was uh, basically, um, expanding our success with Jir Falcon books. So again, you know, uh, we teamed up with, uh, uh, I teamed up with uh, uh, Richard Sale and uh, we approached the same publisher saying, you know, if you want a book, you know, here we have it. And uh, that was in, indeed continuation of my thesis because uh, the uh, Snowy Owl was uh, in my focal, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, in, in my view all the time. And uh, I had uh, hands-on experience and, uh, uh, we wanted the book and you know I'm not really uh, good in writing small papers sort of hypothesis driven you know so it's yeah. a slightly different story here and uh, I wanted to get the book with uh, which uh, shows my views on uh, uh, on the fate and uh, evolution of, of a species and uh, they say yes and again you know that was a very um, good success as far as I know and plus uh, uh, immediately after the publication of the book, uh, there was a huge invasion of snowy owls uh, in the United States, which triggered a very interesting research called Project Snowstorm, and we're still okay, collaborating yeah, on that. that. Yeah. So it was a pretty sort of uh, good timing for that. And uh, I have to say that uh, the fate of a species uh, um, is really in dire straits. You know, it's, uh, survival is not good. Its range is shrinking very rapidly. And uh, I think uh, we are going to have uh, really big problems with, uh, um, with the loss of uh, potential uh, habitat for, for the species. And um, 
obviously often when when species are, are struggling it's it's normally a, a it's not you can't put it down to one single factor what what do you think it might what do you think one of the 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 big driving force loss of habitat loss of prey they're quite oh, you said about uh, about uh, and this is excuse my ignorance i only know little bits about snowy owls um but but you have these eruptions don't you where where birds appear um based on food it's driven by the diet am i right well, uh, <clears throat> the snowy owl is uh, a bit uh, complicated uh, so first it is uh, cyclic species so when you see disappearance of cycles, you need to have several cycles to prove that we have declining uh, cyclicity or something. And uh, we don't have luxury to monitor it. Second, uh, um, you know, the species is rather large. It's sort of second largest owl. And plus, uh, for a central place forager, is, you know, like, you know, if, uh, if you're Arctic fox, you can collect small lemmings all over the place and bring milk to, to the kitten, uh, to, to the cubs. Mm -hmm. uh, snowy owl cannot do it it has to deliver large prey to the nest. And if you cannot get the large lemming, you cannot feed the chick. Energetics of that cannot yeah. support um, the um, uh, uh, delivery rate uh, to, to the large broods. And uh, that was uh, the focal point of the, uh, of the book, actually. It wasn't really well understood, but uh, uh, for species that big, you have to have lemmings of large size. Okay, yeah. And if you don't have large lemmings, which happens, you know, once in 10 years in normal typical tundra, you don't have uh, the success of a species. And plus, the lemmings reproduce. So if you have 300 uh, lemmings per hectare at the end of the summer, you have uh, 280 of this uh, uh, lemmings, 20 grams or less. You cannot sustain uh, eight uh, or eight uh, broods. Uh, on such uh, small uh, items. So uh, the uh, owl switched to another prey. And from eight broods, the uh, brood size goes to two. Right, yeah, of course. Yeah, and it's not sustainable. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's going into the sort of the abyss. You see the adults, but they are not uh, sustaining themselves with the young. And uh, I think that is uh, uh, going to be widespread, although, uh, we see uh, more detailed studies in this in Scandinavia where they found, you know, uh, probably all owls in Scandinavia thanks to availability of helicopters. So, but you know, eight individuals breeding for Scandinavia okay, doesn't make a population, to my understanding. No. So, uh, and another factor: uh, the owls, uh, uh, the snow owls, they pick up lemmings in short grass. If you have tall shrub. Forget about lemming hunt. Right. And we see the dramatic uh, shift of uh, shrub vegetation which moves north all over the tundra. Their population, their potential range is shrinking, shrinking very rapidly to the extent that they already lost cyclicity. They try to stay where they can't hunt. Yeah. They, don't, they cannot wait for lemming peak anymore. They try to scoop whatever it is. So they're holding their last uh, uh, sort of uh, bastions uh, of habitat. Uh, they are pushed to the islands. Uh, and uh, again, you know, that's uh, kind of amazing to see. Uh, they're, they're in struggle, they're in dire straits, unfortunately. So something, something I was gonna, I've written down on my notepad, two words that you will probably know very well. It'd be great to get your opinion on. Um, is climate change does is are are snowy owls a in terms of birds of prey are they a victim of climate change definitely uh, yeah because of shrubby vegetation you see in in past uh, 20 years no attempts were made to breed in the area where i had tens of them really yeah. i see it you know once in 5 years non-breeding, and they're trying to, to snatch some goslings. You cannot support, you know, a family on goslings that are not territorially flocks moving down the river. So that, that is really sort of sad. So, um, and the climate change, you know, if, uh, I cannot really sort of, uh, uh, Jimmy, it's, uh, it's a catastrophe, what I see there. Two years ago, I was, uh, um, 
visiting the study area where, where I started before Oxford. Yeah. And uh, that was July. That was first days of July. And I cannot find a place in the, in the Stundra dry enough to put the tent. It was all soaking mud because of a flood, because of a snow melt, local snow melt, was so much that the um, river system cannot cope with it. You see millions of ducks which fail to breed because they have no terrain to breed. It's not about temperature. It's about redistribution of precipitation. And the coastal zone and the tundra lies into that big time, uh, makes the habitat unavailable. Some species do prolific uh, in such periods. Sandhill cranes, no problem. Yeah. Buick swan, wonderful. You know, it's no longer uh, aquatic bird there. It's no longer waterfall. It breeds in flat terrain in polygon tundra. Ralph Legged Buzzard, if I had 30 pairs in my study area, now I have three. Right, wow. For 10 years now, consecutive. They lost, they lost cyclicity. So if you say, uh, what is climate change there? I say it's catastrophe now. The peregrines, I had four pairs in the study area, now 15. No waders. If I see pectoral sandpiper, in the tundra, in my study area where it was background species, now I have to stop. I have to take the picture of the spectral sandpiper because it's that rare. Right. Yeah. All colonies of Ross's gulls disappeared without trace. Uh, great, the, uh, the white Siberian crane, gone. <clears throat> Shrub in the area where there were nests of this bird. I mean, un unthinkable. Ralph Lake Buzzard used to breed on cliffs, on ledges. Forget, it now breeds in the nests of Buick swans in the flat tundra away from the river because the river cliffs are packed with seven meters of snow. Wow. It's not the temperature, it's the precipitation. And uh, this simple factor means the per permafrost melts at enormously fast rate. All long billed waders, um, spot a trap shank. Uh, Curly, the um, uh, bar-tailed godwit. Mm -hmm. Don't see them at all. They're gone because you put the beak in the permafrost, but the active layer is now not 20 centimeters as it used to be. It's now three meters. All the invertebrates go down. They cannot yeah. get it. Poof, no waders. Some birds doing well. Temming sandpiper, wonderful. On the mud, surface feeder, wonderful. But they're too small for the sparrowbirds. Yeah. So it's kind of, a, uh, it's big change. It's big change. You can actually see it in erosion. You can see it in mud. You can see it in your own comfort. Uh, but uh, it's not really good for birds. D dare I, obviously, just, just listening to you there and um, talking about it. Um, I'm, I, I don't know what, what you are, Eugene, but I'm an optimist. But listening to that there, it sounds like it, it's almost, and knowing that you've covered... This, this area for such a long period of time, it sounds like it's gone past the point of return or, or is, is there a chance if we start acting now, we can, we can start making a difference? The, uh, the, the life in the Arctic, you know, since uh, the last uh, glaciation maximum has endured a lot of changes. I think the, the nature will find a way, but there are, you know, there is a saying in Russian, you know, people like Russian proverbs. So pessimist is a well-informed optimist. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm the latter. Um, so um, uh, let's uh, talk about species which uh, I think lost uh, in this uh, Arctic tundra in my study area. It started, you know, before the climate change was a buzzword. So the uh, first one is Sunderland. It was background species when I first arrived, 1982. Come on, you know, I was still, you know, from Leningrad University, unexperienced. I f first saw this nightless days, no nights. I wasn't prepared for that. The sun goes around you. But that time was sundling everywhere. You can see it on the, uh, on the uh, spits. You can see on the um, on migration a lot. 
Now, none, completely none. Yeah. Um, and why we are talking about uh, the areas, coastal areas on migration, that is uh, Southern uh, Chinese Sea. That's a place for spawning of horseshoe crab. These areas are completely gone and converted into shrimp industry. Right. This is not climate change. That is human induced changes of the flyway. Uh, uh, Sunderlings in uh, uh, in Canada were saved because uh, the horseshoe crab was protected at the last moment in Delaware Bay, but it wasn't the case in China. So we lost the species well before that. Again, you know, that is local extinction, but uh, whether it's reversible, probably yes. Uh, we see some new species which are expanding. Sandhill crane is everywhere. It's changing everything. Um, uh, but uh, most of the species which uh, were kind of sensitive, they're already gone. I don't see uh, uh, dunlins uh, too much. I don't see pectoral sandpipers. They're turning into rare species there. And they were everywhere. You know, you look in the tundra, you know, all my memories are on, uh, uh, on May in the tundra is do, 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 everywhere, nonstop. Now, silence. Yeah. Silence. And even, you know, uh, the increasing uh, um, peregrine population, I don't think it can explain it because, you know, yeah, they, they take a big toll on, on waders, but they're still there without waders. So they, they manage somehow, but not really the, um, uh, the, the species which tend to disappear. Uh, Sharp-tailed uh, sandpiper, I didn't see them for 10 years. What happened? I don't know. Uh, there are some hot spots there and now and then, but Hmm. Don't know. Um, so uh, Temming still doing well, but uh, the roughs they're started to decline. I don't know what happened to roughs because they, their habitat, the sort of uh, grassy uh, bogs, they are the same. Yeah. So this kind of big change. So I think uh, the Arctic fauna will endure, but there would be some losses. And especially with this vulnerable species, the cranes are in bad shape, I think. Right. New species are coming. Red, uh, red wing in the tundra, no problem. Field fare to the sort of timber line within probably five years. It made, you know, it was last recorded in Yakutsk and, you know, three years later, it was uh, in the timber line in the uh, late, uh, sort of uh, in my study area. That is 1,000 miles, 1,000 kilometers. Okay. And they're eating Siberian salamanders. Field fair. Siberian salamanders. Well, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we, we see field fairs, obviously, in this country in the, in the winter. Of, um, and, but yeah. it's hardly an Arctic species. That's what I'm saying, you know. Yeah, yeah. As soon yeah. as the permafrost active layer started to increase, off it goes. That means they have earthworm population. We have changes in the soil. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, before I'm um, keeping an eye on the time, uh, there's one species that we can't not talk about because I'll never forgive myself if I don't ask you about Stella's sea eagles because they're uh, one of my favourite. They're right up there. So tell us about your work studying what I think is an incredible bird. Um, I don't, go on. Yeah. What, it's seriously big bird. So uh, again, you know, this story goes uh, again to my first appearance in Magadan as a student. I saw this eagle which took off the whole sky and I assume everybody know the position of the nests. To my surprise, it wasn't so. So uh, uh, we sort of teamed up with uh, another friend. Uh, he was working for the Forest Commission in Scotland at the time, uh, uh, Mike McGrady. Uh, okay, yeah. And uh, he was saying, you know, let's do something to that. So we sort of uh, managed to uh, uh, form an informal group at uh, the Berlin International uh, uh, Conference on Birds of Prey and say, you know, let, let's do this uh, international stuff on the Stellar Sea Eagle. Uh, and uh, at that time, I had a friend who worked in Magadan uh, uh, Nature Reserve, and he said, you know, okay, you know, uh, we're going to hire somebody to, to work on the, uh, on the species, and that was Irina Otekin, and, you know, then we sort of started to, to work from there. Again, you know, that was uh, uh, 
my project, uh, which was designed, so whatever happens to the USSR, we'll still manage to make the monitoring, no matter what, because the uh, samples, uh, so the study areas I selected were uh, doable regardless to what happens to the prices to ruble. Uh, and we did indeed saw the uh, uh, you know, breakdown of the country. We did see the dramatic changes, which are still in turmoil. And uh, yet it's still doable with uh, low, low key technology. So that was a uh, big time. So we started to monitor, uh, we started to see uh, biology of the species. Obviously we started to, uh, come on, you know, we started mapping be before GPS were available. We were that precise. So, you know, I didn't see it coming, but we sort of, we had very precise maps. So we now back uh, backtrack all our previous observations to, to meter accuracy. Yeah. Well, we first uh, uh, sort of started to deploy the micro lights, so the sort of delta wing micro lights. Uh, I remember my first lesson in, uh, uh, in, in Wales. <laughs> that was uh, life challenging. I don't fly it uh, still, but... Uh, um, I was trying to, you know, I, in order to get the license in, in Britain, you had to own it. So yeah. that was you know, unfortunate. Um, uh, but anyhow, uh, now we sort of uh, opt for drones, which are much easier and more uh, bird friendly. But thanks to this uh, efforts, we know where the birds were, how they react on the different changes uh, in the environment. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, this species is very vulnerable too thanks to the demand for fish. And uh, if uh, Japanese overfishing is now no longer a problem, uh, but Russian demand for caviar is driving it. So we don't see large spawning grounds anymore. Uh, and it's difficult to say whether it has uh, immediate negative effect on the eagles, but uh, human disturbance certainly is. So how many, just just to give put, put, paint a bit of a picture, how many, um... How many pairs roughly were you studying when you first started compared to what, what you're on now? What, what sort of numbers? The... So uh, again, you know, uh, let, let's sort of narrow it. Uh, we have uh, several levels of uh, uh, study area. One co covers the entire uh, coast of the uh, Sea of Okhotsk. Which is, you know, if, you, if, you st if I start my um, you know, small um, boat uh, and start to check them at the countable time, I'll just, just about to finish it uh, within a month. Um, so it's pretty large and has about 400 uh, known nest locations. Uh, the smaller ones, which we check every year, no matter what, uh, they have uh, 20 pairs in one, we have uh, 40 pairs on the coastal side, we have uh, 40 uh, territories in another site. So there are portions of the coast which are surveyed, uh, uh, no matter what, and um, we see a decline in the breeding output. Uh, the river systems, so they stop breeding in some years, and uh, we link it to floods, uh, summer floods, which were not part of the game uh, in previous 50 years. The water was transparent, the fish was visible. Now we have uh, all the ranger cabins flooded, um, uh, and every year they have historic floods, but uh, uh, that is uh, uh, the problem with, uh, with the lack of ice in the Arctic Ocean. It's like, you know, you go with steaming saucepan, open the lid and you have this vapor coming in, which immediately falls in snow. The snow melts in summer and you have these floods, which last for months. Yeah. So that is, uh, again, you know, uh, I hate to say it's global warming, but uh, that is the, the immediate result of loss of ice. And this loss of ice uh, manifests uh, in increased snow cover uh, and unpredictable snow cover in rivers. This floods makes fish invisible. So we see many, many pairs fail year to year to year. They try to nest, but nothing happens. So that is a major threat. And now we have another threat which comes in uh, in uh, uh, in the sea coast. The sea coast was considered to be very stable in terms of breeding locations, and uh, we're talking about sort of uh, 50 to 100 pairs breeding pairs uh, in our uh, constant uh, study areas. And now, believe me or not, uh, the uh, uh, coastline is uh, uh, ice-free all winter. And I, I don't see any mechanism behind that, but uh, I see the uh, uh, birds which have no ice cover in the view of their nest sites stop breeding. Uh, 
Uh, we see this uh, in uh, in the Talayan Island, the famous island with one million plus bird seabird colony. They have three pairs, well, two constant three uh, uh, possible pairs of Estella seagulls, just two hundred meters apart, yeah. and they also skip breeding with million birds. That means something uh, is missing in early spring when the birds don't arrive. The eagles breed earlier. So again, the mechanism isn't really widely known, although I have a hint, and that is why this uh, spectacular bird has so massive beak. We have uh, a uh, sort of idea that they are linked to the um, seal pups. That is the only bird which can open the sea pup. And the sea pups require solid ice to breed. Right, okay. And if they don't breed in front of their uh, um, uh, nest sites, then no breeding. Yeah. Uh, so that is uh, why there is a link with sea, uh, sea ice. And uh, we see the sea ice disappearing very, very rapidly. The wintering locations in Hokkaido more or less cease to exist. They are now in Vladivostok seaport every winter. Uh, spectacular actually coexistence with humans in a very busy seaport, but uh, that is where you see some ice flow. Uh, I think it will shift further north uh, to the seaport of Nahotka next uh, next few five years. Uh, and um, again, you know, the species are limited with the uh, distribution of uh, um, nest locations in the north. Uh, because uh, in the very north uh, of the Sea of Okotsk, there's still a good uh, seal population. And yet, they don't have breeding trees. They don't have anything which sticks around to put the nest. So the nest site limited up there and whether they're going to shift there or how, we don't know yet. But last few years, you appear to the uh, to this uh, uh, sea harbor uh, in the town and something strange feeling, you don't see seals. Usually you put the boat, you have at least 10 heads popping out, looking at you, now yeah. zero. The seals are gone. And yet the fish is there, but the seals aren't. So that is big significant shifts. You you notice it one by one, you know, one species is different, you know, Holoturia has disappeared at the tidal zone, and you see the seals disappearing. That is very alarming. But that is really spectacular and massive bird of prey, and you know, it's, it would be there's, a shame to lose. Yeah, there's there's it, it just I was just thinking then when you mentioned about the, the lack of nest sites um, or of trees for, for nesting, because they'll nest on cliffs, won't they, around the coast, and then also you'll get them on in in, a, in tr trees as well. And yeah, but you see, you see, see, Jim, you know, even on cliffs, you need to have branches. Mm. You, you arrive to the uh, tundra uh, cliff, where do you get the branches? You need to build a nest. Oh yeah, of course to build the nest. Sorry, yeah. Um, have you? Has anyone, or has it ever, have you ever thought, or has it got to the point where, in some of the areas, you like, like what they've done with ospreys in in the UK, where they've built platforms to to help the eagles, or is it is it is that too big a task? Is it not, or is it not at that point that you need to support them in that way? Uh, well, that thought occurs to our mind that we even tried to make the nest platforms for the eagles in the Magadan State Reserve. None of them were occupied. The eagles ignore it uh, uh, and brutally build the nest on very shitty trees next to it. But uh, the um, uh, whole thing is very difficult, you know, uh, compared to Britain, uh, if you are to put the pole somewhere there, um, first in terms of expanse nowadays, it just, you know, you need to get really big log uh, 300 miles to the north, uh, probably with air transportation. Then you have to dig a hole that requires a uh, really mechanized auger. Yeah. And then uh, probably a few years later, it will be knocked down by the gale force winds, which is normal thing there. It's one of the most windy coasts in the world. So I don't think the survival of this net pl nest platform is sort of really good. And another thing is, you know, you need to play with the eagles. If we see the attempts, uh, they will probably play along, but they're so scattered. Uh, they are driven by their winter sort of or autumn behavior. Uh, kind of, maybe you can sort of uh, think about it, but, you know, transportation to, to this uh, coast, uh, 
No, well, well I, I did have a feeling, you know, I did have a feeling you'd say getting a pole or a, or some t timber to to these regions would be nigh on expensive and, and nigh on impossible potentially. And and I didn't think about that. You like you say, get that you know putting one up and then it getting damaged. You know, in the gales as well. So, uh, yeah, I, they're they're one of them species for me. You know, as a as a kid growing up, and you flick through these books, and and you look at you look at pictures of you know, for me, Philippine eagle and and all these wild ones. What there's a famous there's a picture that sticks with me, and I don't know if I probably won't be able to describe it. It's a stellar sea eagle nesting on like a sea stack. And there's a guy, I think it's on the Peregrine Foot, it might even be on, I don't know what website it's in, and there's a guy going over to the to the nest and it's on a big stack. And the, the scenery around this Stella Seagull's nest is just mind-blowing. But then saying that, I've seen some of your footage, Eugene, from drones where you're flying, you're checking nests with the drone and some of those nests and the terrain and the scenery is just... Yeah, it's mind blowing. It, mind blowing, yeah. indeed. Yes, I agree. It's mind blowing, and uh, you just you know sit somewhere on the ridge. You see the nice uh, female uh, feeding chicks with this nice fish. Uh, uh, you see this um, white rumped swifts buzzing around, and uh, you think, oh dear, you know, and I'm getting paid for that. <laughs> it, it is just unbelievable. Yes, uh, brilliant. But well, again, you know, it's not for everybody. Um, no, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know. I definitely like. I definitely wouldn't mind making a trip. That's for sure. That that's uh, definitely. Um, and one more question before I'm just conscious of time. This is. I've got to ask you this. I ask uh, a lot of people this question that we've had on, um, because I get asked a lot by graduates, young graduates, not necessarily graduates, people who want to get into monitoring birds of prey. Um, if you would give someone and obviously you work with students um all the time if you were to give someone one bit of advice when it comes to monitoring birds of prey what what would it be what would dr eugene potapov's advice be make a journal and record everything in pencil Brilliant. that is something which might potentially feed all your life Brilliant. make a journal fantastic Researchers have no memory. Journal does. Fantastic. Excellent. Great answer. That's all we needed. Right, uh, Eugene, I won't keep up any more of your time. Um, we've done well over an hour, so I'll, uh, I'll end the live, live feed there. Thank, thank you very much again. Oh, pleasure is mine. Always, uh, always here to help. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot.